All right, welcome back, everybody. This is DDP here to talk a little bit of Mavericks free agency with Zach Cunningham, a new writer for the Dallas Prospect. You may have seen his work before. Uh, Zach, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Derek? I'm good. I'm good. Getting excited for some uh, some some free agency and all that. Obviously, we just had the NBA Awards show last night. We can touch on that, I guess, a little bit later. Although, obviously, as far as Mavericks are concerned, we know the outcome there with Luca. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm really amped for this free agency period to get started. It feels different than it's felt for the Mavericks in some time, obviously. Well, I mean, when you compare it to the last few years, when uh, you know, the the team hasn't been very great, and really Dallas was pretty limited on on what they could do and, and the flexibility they had, and and really the young talent they had. I mean, this this summer is completely different. I don't think they've had this much. You know, I don't I don't really want to. I feel like they haven't had this much hope in, in, in years. Like Luca and, and Porzingis is a very exciting young duo. And that's not just a sentiment that's, that's put out there by Mavs fans and the Mavs themselves. Like other, other free, other uh, front offices and other reporters are, are really uh, looking at that in a high light. So it, it, there's really a lot of reasons to be excited. Oh, a- absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned the Mavericks. We we've, always tried talking ourselves, at least as an organization, maybe more so than the city as a whole, uh, talking ourselves into being like in contention for some of these bigger names. And we've always seen us go after the proverbial big fish and it just hasn't panned out. Uh, the closest we came was 2015 getting snubbed at the last moment by DeAndre. But, you know, there were swings and misses for guys like LeBron, Chris Paul, Dwight Howard, even Hassan Whiteside. And if the Mavericks did get these meetings, more often than not, it felt like they were just leverage. Uh, for that player to get a new deal with their existing team as was. So it, it's this one's a little different because, yeah, with Luca and Porzingis, obviously you have something that you can offer now that you never could before, and it's a much better building block than a 30, you know, 33, 34, and so on year old Dirk Nowitzki and little else. So I am optimistic, but at the same time, I, I have. I have uh, been maybe a little bit jaded over the years, and I think that's how a lot of Maverick fans feel. You see a divided reaction on that front. Yeah, and there's that's definitely not uh, not something that surprises me. Like I definitely understand, mm-hmm. and it's funny because like when you look at a lot of those free agent, you know, free agent opportunities that didn't pan out, or Dallas was kind of left at the altar. It's kind of funny to me looking back at it, like really how many of those I'm glad didn't come to fruition. I mean, Dwight Howard. Uh, yep. His health has been a consistent issue since then. Yep. Not to mention, the lo- I don't know how many locker rooms he's wrecked since then. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Chris Paul probably would have been one of the better ones that would have panned out. Although, I mean, we, we've seen kind of how his attitude can can grate on other teammates. Yeah, he doesn't really have a locker room that he's played in that didn't eventually hate him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it. it's it's one of those things where it's like you may, maybe counted as a blessing that those didn't come to fruition for Dallas. But, I mean, I think what really, you know, kind of rankles Mavs fans about the Dwight Howard thing is that it cost him Giannis Antetokounmpo and that Donnie Nelson yep. was ready to go on him. Uh, it, we don't like to mention that and uh, for good reason. Um, and, and really the biggest free agency signing they've had in the last, you know, five, six years was Chandler Parsons. And mm-hmm. really, to, to be fair to Chandler Parsons, that was a good signing. And yeah. Uh, it was kind of fun prying him away from Houston um, and Dallas, you know, at the time there was a lot of debate on whether they should, you know, after, or when he was about to go for his player option, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, Dallas had that choice of whether, do we give him a max deal or do we go with Harrison Barnes? And they decided not to. And then, you know, of course he signs that deal with Memphis and yep. then promptly gets, you know, another knee surgery. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he hadn't finished either of his two years with Dallas. He'd had, off-season knee surgeries in both cases. I can't remember if it was the same knee, but either way, yeah, it was definitely a good decision. I know we give Harrison Barnes a little bit of a hard time in terms of what people wanted him to be versus what he really was as a player, or is as a player, I guess I should say. But yeah, there's there's no doubt in terms of that either-or scenario. They definitely made the right decision like 100 times over because Parsons is one of the worst contracts in the NBA right now. Uh, and I think Memphis is stuck with them, I think, the rest of this year, too. But, yeah, out, outside of Parsons, they really haven't gotten anybody of significance. And, 
you know, they've they've always been good at scrambling to kind of find pieces to put together, to put together a competent roster, you know, before the 20, what was it, 13, 14 team got kind of torpedoed by the addition of the Rondo trade. That was a great offense, and you had Tyson Chandler, Dirk, Monte. Jameer Nelson. Jameer Nelson, the weak link in the point guard position for sure. Uh, but you looked at that team on paper and you thought, okay, this is good. And this was like a dominant offensive team. And so you still kind of were able to talk yourself into it. They wanted to build their core of the future, uh, you know, that immediate future then around that bunch plus Rondo. And we saw how that was just an utter train wreck of a decision. So they've they've done well in scramble mode. Like you look at how quickly they've gone through oops, rebuilds. And for the most right. part... Most part, they haven't uh, panned out to this point, but it's been different as it is, as opposed to now because now you have a 20-year-old Luka Doncic, the 2018-19 Rookie of the Year, and a 23, I think he'll be 24 early in the season, Kristaps Porzingis uh, to build around. So it's a very different outlook, and when you have $30 million roughly in cap space, there's a lot of flexibility you have. It's not quite enough to go get necessarily a Kimball Walker. But, I mean, with another move or two, another slight move to adjust your cap, you could create that space theoretically if you wanted. Yeah, and Kimball Walker, um, if, if you were, if the Dallas were to offer him the max, which I think would be four years, $140 million, mm-hmm. you know, give or take a little bit, uh, his first year salary under that deal, I think, would be $32.5 million. And I mentioned that in the article. Yep. And like you said, Dallas right now is sitting, I think, just shy of $30 million, uh, in salary cap space for the coming season. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, they – and it's been talked about, the Courtney Lee contract, um, they could stretch wave him yep. and get, I think, $6 million more in cap space. It's either six or eight. I have to go back and look at the numbers. Uh, it's six, yeah, because you, you have to take however long they have left on the deal, which is one year for him, and then you add a year, so you're breaking it up over two years. So, yeah, $6 million. I've been seeing like conflicting things, like whether they could stretch him out over three years or two years. I'll have to go hmm. back and fine-tune whatever that is. Okay. But, doing whatever that is, uh, doing the stretch wave for him, which obviously would not be the most uh, ideal situation. I think Dallas would rather, and I've heard this from different people, I, I think Dallas would rather trade him outright than yeah. be dealing with his deal for the next couple of years. Uh, but if they do that, whether deal him or stretch and wave him, then they'll have enough to, to get Kimba in there on that first year um, of, of his max deal. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I want to mention that Chandler Parsons, he's actually in his last year of that deal. So he's actually a $25 million expiring contract now for the Memphis yeah. Grizzlies. Yeah, that's true. Because, yeah, like we said earlier, it was both guys a four-year, $94 million, and Barnes opted out, surprisingly, of his deal, his $25 million. So I don't I don't know if Parsons, you said same thing, $25 million. So, yeah. Uh, How time flies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dealing with these kind of deals. I'm sure Memphis doesn't feel like time has flown for them with that contract. <laughs> Man, it's like if you look at their salary cap or their uh, ballot or their their sheet for the 1920 season, mm-hmm. it's like every like every deal besides him is like under 10 million dollars. I think you have Avery Bradley's 12.9 million dollar deal, which is non guaranteed. Yeah, and which that's a name the Mavericks might. I, I can just I can see that coming. I don't know. I, I can see the Mavericks. That just seems like a name that would be a Maverick, Avery Bradley. I've wanted him on there for years. Yeah, very good but, defender. Uh, I'm not super familiar with his recent three-point shooting, but I, I knew him obviously much better from when he was in Boston. Yeah, and, and depending on who you talk to, but, but Mavericks fans or whatever, they'll have very polarizing opinions on Avery Bradley. But Chandler Parsons' deal is just like sticks out like a sore thumb yeah. out of all these like Kyle Anderson at nine million, CJ Miles at eight point seven, Jay Crowder now at seven point eight, and then Chandler Parsons at twenty five million. It's just, yeah. It's funny how these look on paper. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, uh, so that's one of the other things, too. You mentioned the polarizing reaction of the fan base. You have a lot of people who obviously still want us to go get to them. If anything is less than a free agent of a substantial tier, like a Kimball Walker even, who's not a top-tier free agent. He's in that next tier. You know, he's not like a Kawhi or a Kevin Durant or uh a Kyrie I, I would say not even a Clay Thompson necessarily even though Thompson's ACL might kind of level that out in the immediate but there are fans that definitely look at it as if you don't at least get like Kimba or something of that level that the off season's kind of a bust like I, I think you have people who look at it and say if we were to end up with a Patrick Beverly a Terrence Ross and 
what would be another good one of that same ilk? Bohan Bogdanovich would be a nice name to have. Oh, I'd, I'd love Bogdanovich for sure. Uh, point, point in that is just to say that there's a really polarizing reaction where even if it makes the team substantially better, the reaction is going to be we missed out on the big fishes again, and this is what we wound up with, with a bunch of nice role players, which is good. It makes your team better. But it still feels to some fans perhaps as a missed opportunity because at the open of free agency, the Mavericks are going to give the offer sheet to KP. That's a five-year, $158 million deal. That's obviously huge. I'm a little surprised they're doing it on the front end. I would have thought they would have tried to shore him up last because at having his rights, they can you know go over the cap for it. It's not a problem. So I'm a little surprised they're throwing that out there as their like first action, if you will. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't think that's anything to be concerned about. I think the the point is like th- they're reaching the agreement with him, mm-hmm. and I'm sure he understands this that they're going to loop back around to him after everything else has been taken care of, so they yeah. can go face a big fish because they can go over the cap to re-sign him. Yep. And I, I, I when that came out today, it was really kind of funny when Shams tweeted that today because it was like, what did we go back to February? Like we've known this; they weren't yeah. going to trade for him without the intention of maxing him. So exactly, and yet really you still odd. and yet you still have some people who are like shocked like oh you gotta see if he can stay healthy for a year first you want to give him a qualifying let him play out the qualifying offer and then have to do this again next year like you lock him up if you can lock him up like i i know i know the concern it's been over a year since he's played but you, you can't fool around with that especially since they've had the chance to have their doctors evaluate him and he's obviously gone through full contact practices and everything so yeah, he could have played to end last year. I was I was watching a Q and A on the Athletic by Tim Cato. Mm-hmm. Someone was asking about like, are we concerned about Porzingis? You know, it's going to be a twenty months since his last NBA game. And and Cato, who I, I really like to read, came out and said he could have played at the end of last year. Like he was yeah. ready, but there was no point in risking that when Dallas was sitting there like at twenty and fifty, and they're trying to see maybe if they can hang on to that lottery pick. So right. I, I'm not as worried about his health. I mean, there's going to be some rust. But I mean, for crying out loud, he and Luca are in their early twenties. Like, I, even though the 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 title race is so much more open next year, mm-hmm. I mean, Dallas probably is not winning the title next year. So, no. like, I'm more curious. And like, next year will be exciting, and getting to see Luca and KP together for the first time will be amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm more like curious about them two years from now, like when yeah. they've had, because I mean, they're gonna have all off season this year to get on the same page and like focus on basketball and not rehab anymore. Um, so that's going to be cool. But like in two years, I'm, I'm, it's probably when I'm more excited to see what they can do on the court. Um, I mean, but the playoffs would be great next year, but yeah, I, I'm not worried about, uh, about any, I, I mean, I guess with a seven foot three guy having a torn ACL, obviously that's not ideal. And the history with that people of that height and those kind of injuries, is not good. Mm-hmm. But as far as like, I, he really could have probably played last year. At least that's what I read when I read Tim Cato's Q and a. So yeah, I'm, I, I don't think that he's not basketball ready. I think he is. Right. Yeah, I'm not too worried about uh, Porzingis, obviously. I'm curious to see what Dallas can put around them because, in a sense, they need two or three more starters, obviously. You're going to have to figure out your point guard situation and part of the blowing up of the team that we started the year with last year and the deal for Porzingis. You send out Dennis Smith Jr., uh, which really his his thing was more than anything other than just him being a raw prospect with a lot of athleticism. He just no longer fit the timeline because Luca, in his ridiculous ability, like accelerated the growth of this team to the point where instead of looking four or five years down the road, it's like, nope, let's start looking in the next year or two for getting back to real contention. So uh, they're going to have to figure out point guard, and that's why a name like Kimba is so so significant in in the minds of who we want to target because Charlotte has has themselves a pickle. They've made it clear they don't really want to keep paying the luxury tax even if even though they can give him the super max which I think would be like 220 million plus. Th- yeah, 221 million over 5 years. <sighs> yeah. I I love Kimba but that that is a very high price tag and There's four players in the NBA that should ever make that money. The system is kind of broken right now. Yes, absolutely. And it's something too where even if even if Kimba, you know, people saying, "Well, Kimba suggested he'd be willing to take less to stay in Charlotte." 
I don't doubt that he'd be willing to take less than the super max. I don't think you're getting him to take like much less than like a standard, what a standard max would be. And even then Charlotte in their situation, even if they only gave him a veteran minimum, they're going to go over the cap. Like they're in cap hell right now. So Charlotte I think is in a terrible situation right now. It's yeah. an absolute disaster. I mean, it's a lose, lose. Yes. Uh, not, not, not to cut you off, but like they, and Kimba says like he would take less than the max or less than the super max. Well, yeah, I mean, 185 million is less than the max, but yes, that's still a ridiculous contract. Mm-hmm. And I, so the, the thing that concerns me about this and, and Charlotte is like I said, in a lose, lose situation, if they resign him to a huge deal, they don't have any flexibility to make them better, which is what he wants. Yes. If they let him go, they're still in a bad salary situation. And then they've just lost their, their icon. Yeah, their and, franchise's all-time leader in points scored and all that. So, I mean, ima- I mean, we, we talk about we kind of moan about sometimes the Mavericks being a situation. Imagine, imagine being in that position. I mean, yeah. that's a. I would hate to be a Charlotte fan right now. Well, but, yeah, I mean, imagine uh, where Dallas was a year ago. You know, obviously with Dennis Smith and everything. Uh, Dirk, we knew that last year. We pretty much knew it was going to be the last year, even though we didn't want to quite believe it uh, as the season wore on and we started seeing the finish line in sight for him. But, I mean, if not for landing on Luka, like if you don't hit on that pick and then from that be able to swing the KP trade, it's horrifying where we could be right now uh, looking at Harrison Barnes and Dennis Smith as your probably top two guys next year. So, yeah, yeah it's it's crazy. Charlotte's going to have to do something. And if they let Kimba go, I think they're going to go into complete rebuild mode. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll, I mean, Michael Jordan will absolutely hate that. But, I mean, what else are you going to do? But not, Yeah, not I, really anything they could. I'll say this about, and we were talking a second ago about how there's always going to be a section of the fan base who, if the Mavericks, say, for example, they don't get Kimba, but they get Patrick Beverly mm-hmm. and Terrence Ross. Yep. That's fine. And I feel like the fan base this year is a little more lenient towards that because they, from what I've seen in the conversations I've had with people on Twitter, it's like, they know that the playoffs are a very likely scenario next year. Like it's, it's reachable. Mm-hmm. And there is a healthy section of Twitter of Mavs Twitter, which is like, great, get us more role pieces. You know, we don't, I, I almost feel like there's maybe more of that, more in support of that than paying your entire salary cap to Kimba Walker. But yeah, I'll say this. Um, I don't know if you read Rob Mahoney for sports illustrated. He's a, I've read him for years. Mm-hmm. He put a, a top 50 free agency, uh, NBA free agency, 2019 top 50 players. And he ranked them. Okay. He had Kimba at number five, wow. right under Kawhi, Durant, Kyrie Irving, and Jimmy Butler. He put Kimba ahead of Klay Thompson. Now, you can say what you want about that, but maybe as Mavericks fans, we think about this too much. I feel like if if you have a chance to sign Kimba Walker, mm-hmm. you sign Kimba Walker. I oh, mean, yeah. you worry about the, the fit mechanics, or not the mechanics, but the fit, the details of that. Mm-hmm work with that during the season. I mean, Kimba Walker has, and I heard a great quote on this. I think it was uh, Mark Stein on the Ben Simmons pod said that he's done kind of what Paul George did. Like he was already really good. Yep. Now he's like made himself, he's taken that. I think it actually may, may have been Zach Lowe. I don't, forgive me, but he's gone from very good to like superstar good elite, which is really, really difficult in yep. the NBA. Yep. I am like the, the thought of Kimba being a Maverick is, is super exciting for me. And yeah. I feel like that would be, obviously the biggest free agent signing that Dallas has ever had. And I, I really think that that would be a, a, I mean, that would just be a great situation. Yeah, a- absolutely. And you know, it, it would be the biggest free agent signing in some time, arguably ever. And it gives you that third superstar. That's the discussion and the debate being had is, do you use all your cap then to get that, uh, to get Kemba, have your three headed uh, monster, so to speak, and then fill out the roster from there with, more or less veteran minimum guys, or if you can find some way to deal Courtney Lee, whether you're figuring out. See, see, here's the thing on the sign and trade possibility people brought up the other day regarding uh, how you get Kemba perhaps through the sign and trade. I don't think Charlotte wants to take back money. They don't want to go into the over the cap and have to pay that tax bill. And so I don't think you're going to be able to jettison like Courtney Lee or Tim Hardaway Jr. that way. And, you know, unless you're just for some reason wanting to jettison Jackson, which I don't want to do that. I, I don't think that there's 
really a perfect fit in that scenario. I think if you do get Kemba, it's probably in an outright signing situation. And you're going to have fierce competition. You're going to have to consider, you know, today the latest on that is that Boston and Dallas are the two biggest threats to sign him away from Charlotte. And I think it was Tim McMahon was on, uh, what was it? it was on the fan earlier today, and he was talking about, or no, I guess it was ESPN. He was on the radio earlier today talking about uh, Kemba being really an East Coast guy. He loves it in Charlotte, but he understands that might not be what's going to work out at this point. So the Celtics being in a weaker Eastern Conference on you know the, around the East Coast and everything, that's going to be really hard to challenge, especially with Kyrie's exit because. He can do a lot of what Kyrie does, only you don't hear about him being a pain in the ass. So that's going to be probably the favorite, I think, even though we're only now hearing about them. That might be the favorite to get him over Dallas. And then, of course, people have also floated his name to the Lakers. And honestly, for their for their tandem now with Anthony Davis and LeBron, Kimba fits better there in terms of his window, given he's a 30-year-old point guard who hasn't really won anything. I don't think the Lakers are as – I mean, I know Stein tweeted a few weeks ago or maybe just a week ago that they'll make Kimba their number one prospect. Mm-hmm. I, I And Stein doesn't tweet that unless it's like there's some weight to it. Yeah. I, I feel like – and he, he was on, like I said, the Ben Simmons pod today. He was saying that Dallas has been like the team Charlotte fears most in mm-hmm. terms of losing Kimba to another team. Yeah. And then he, he added that, you know, with Boston coming into the picture today, he said, I might have to amend that. So – it's clearly going to be, I think, between Boston and, and, and Dallas. Now, one thing he did mention is that, you know, in, in Boston, Kimba would have maybe more of an opportunity to be Kimba, kind mm-hmm. of in the same vein of, like, being the closer, like in Charlotte. Yeah, it, It's really amazing when you think about what he's done in Charlotte and, like, the numbers that he's put up. And not just the numbers, but the improvement while being the sole focal point of that entire offense. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's honestly insane how he's been able to do that while being, like, defenses are already game game planning for him. Yeah. So and there's questions like, would Kimba be, how would he accept? It's not, would he be mad? It's more like, how would he accept? How would he, you know, fit in with Dallas being, you know, potentially a second or third option? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think he would be. And having to be off ball more often than he would in Boston too. It, it would, it would be, it would be different. I don't necessarily believe it would be bad. I think it would work. And Carlisle is the perfect coach for a situation like that in that he values multiple ball handlers Mm -hmm. to run that offense so i i think there's more reasons to be yes there's questions but i feel like there's more reasons to be positive than 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 down on that but um yeah boston i hadn't really thought about them um as as far as a suitor for kimba walker and i really do think i would actually if he does go there i would really pull for him because he's a great character guy Mm -hmm. and i think he would be great there but um but yeah i i feel like it's it's going to come down to the mavericks and the celtics yeah. And I, mean, I don't want to say who I think it's going to be because I really, I mean, that won't really mean much now on June 25th. Right. But yeah, it, it, it's definitely going to be interesting to see. And I, I know everyone's notifications are going to be going off on, hmm. you know, 501 yep. at June 30th. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be, uh, any and I are going to be live streaming during all that. So hopefully we'll have a bonanza of updates coming in during that time. But yeah, I, I think Boston is definitely uh, a serious threat even though they're kind of a late emerging contender for his services it does make a lot of sense and you know whether whether dallas looks to go all in for a guy like kimba you know now you you heard i think it was yesterday the report apparently or the rumor that they're going to get a meeting with Kawhi leonard as well i don't think there's any likelihood of that in terms of getting him but it's still a guy that like if the opportunity is there to use a baseball phrase, you got to run out the ground ball. You know, you got to at least take your shot at it because yeah. that that's a transformative signing where suddenly, you know, that's like finding your number one option when you had no intention of not no intention of finding a new number one option, but that's certainly not what you're thinking was. You're like, all right, let's find the number two guy or like the two a something like that. And then like, Oh, Holy crap. Here's Kawhi Leonard possibly. So I, I don't think that's, the direction it goes but other options dallas could consider and we we keep seeing i think patrick beverly and dallas kind of circling each other a little bit we've seen on twitter and everything luca and uh beverly kind of you know hinting at their mutual interest in playing together uh i think with when the news broke today 
well, broke again. We knew of this since February, <laughs> we, but we broke <laughs> rebroke the news today about Porzingis uh, getting that offer sheet from Dallas. Beverly tagged him on Twitter and basically was like, "Yeah, go get that money, big guy." You know, like he's yeah. he's definitely staying at the forefront of the mind and on the radar. And I think there's a real chance that that's who they get. And what's good about him, other than the fact that he's a hard nosed defender, he's an irritant that you'd rather have on your team than you know on the other team. He's also a great three-point shooter, shot 39% last year, and he's an off-ball point guard. Like he he played with James Harden when Harden was an MVP runner-up playing point guard. So, yeah, he can he can absolutely work in that regard for Dallas. He's a defender that they need. They need to surround Luka and KP with shooters and defenders. He can check both those boxes while being off-ball and a cheaper price tag. But yeah. And Brad yeah. Townsend has been very bullish on Patrick Beverly. Uh, he he's mentioned it multiple times in different articles. He said on uh, another podcast, I think it was the Locked Up Mass podcast a few days ago. That he said, I think he was asked like, "What's a name that you think is most likely to be here?" And if Dallas does go this route, he said, "Patrick Beverly." I would I would not be surprised. And mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, that incident with the fan last year, I think I think that might get that gets brought up, and I, and understandably so. Yeah, that's I, that's a good point. I honestly forgot about that. Yeah, I really think Patrick Beverly. Like, I I feel very confident that if they go the we're going the role players mode, like mm-hmm. you don't get a big guy for thirty two million, we're gonna have to split this cap space up among other role players. I I strongly think that that is a very good possibility. Just from everything I've read, he's his interactions with Luca and and Porzingis today, notwithstanding, I I really don't know how much you can actually read into those. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, just, he's going to have other other suitors. So Dallas yeah. is not going to be alone. Oh in, yeah, he, you've been hearing as many as five different teams want to talk with him, including Chicago yeah. for some reason. Clippers, Sixers, Lakers. I mean, he's mm-hmm. going to have no. The, the price tag kind of scares me a little bit. I think Bobby Marks said a few days ago that he he wouldn't be surprised if if Beverly commands like a fourteen or fifteen million you know dollar payday. Which yeah, that man, is a little for, high. That that's a little high. But I mean. Yeah. I mean, are, are, are you cool with 12 billion? So 12, yeah, 10 to 12, I think I'm still cool. If we start going 14, 15, I start getting a little antsy. But it, I mean, it's one of those things too where you don't want to let him linger out there too long while you consider it. It's like you don't want to make that your initial offer, obviously. But if free agency is not working out the way you're hoping, then maybe that's something where you come back and you willingly bump up, like, okay, we need to at least get him. But with that kind of market out there for him, you might not be able to get away with him beyond the first day or two tops before he yeah. lands somewhere. I mean, maybe a couple days because he's got several meetings, obviously, as you just said, to go through. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I like the idea of adding him for what he can bring, the the hard nose defender and the three-point shooting off ball. That fits great, allows you to keep the ball mostly in Lucas' hands. But as you already touched on earlier, Carlisle likes to run a two uh, two guard lineup, basically two ball handlers in the lineup. And with that being the case, Luca's not going to have the ball every possession, every game. Anyway, you're going to have to balance that out. And unless you're banking on a JJ Barea return, looking anything like he did before, I know he's hoping to play with, uh, the, was the Puerto Rican national team in August. Um, I just don't, I don't think that's the, what you want to bank on, even though Barea was having a career year before that Achilles injury last year. So I don't know. Um, you know, that's when, that's where Kimbo would make some sense. Another guy who can right. be ball dominant but not have to be. And while their styles might not perfectly mesh, hey, we always say we have one of the best coaches in the league. Here's phenomenal players figure out how to make it work, especially phenomenal players with no attitude. Yeah. And I, I think, like I said, I, I don't have any doubts about Kimba. I mean, obviously I have questions, but I, I really think that pairing w- would end up being just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wanted to mention something too. You mentioned the the – report about Kawhi. Yes. Also, um, I, I saw this, a co- I heard this a couple weeks ago. Uh, first, with the Kawhi thing, Chris Sheridan, and that got a lot of attention when he said that. Um, and Eddie Sefko, like if I had any like doubts about like, oh, well, why would he even tweet this? Like there's no way. Like we're yeah. conditioned to think that there's no way the Mavericks would even be on Kawhi's radar. Mm-hmm. First of all, the, the tweet was only in reference to a meeting. It wasn't it even, it didn't say anything like Kawhi is considering Dallas. Yeah. But the Mavs, Per a math source, um, let me find the tweet here. I mean, it said, per a, a person very close to the Mavs just told me that Dallas is expecting to get a meeting with Kawhi Leonard. Like, so you look at that, and then Eddie Sefko said, very interesting. 
Chris is not known for going off like and just spouting this stuff off. So I mean, yeah. as a Mavs fan, like I look at that and I get initially like super excited, and then you think like, okay, well, it's just a meeting. Let's just let's set the expectation there at just a meeting, and I mm-hmm. think that's fine because like you're, it's kind of a in terms of like getting your hopes up, it's like a low risk, high reward you know situation where like okay you get a meeting well maybe he likes the meeting maybe then you go from there mm-hmm. so i i don't think mass fans should disavow that i mean i think it's easy to because people are like well we've been hearing raptors and clippers for you know the entire season yeah so why are the mavericks coming in now and i'm curious too because like that kind of like that tweet got 1300 likes and there's been like nothing since then right uh, also on a different note um tim mcmahon was on um 103.3 ESPN a mm-hmm. week or so ago. And I had this as my pinned tweet for a while. Cause it, it struck me as like, Oh my goodness. I didn't even think about this. Um, the, we talked about Mark Cuban running out ground balls and Mark Stein verified this too. He said, you know, he's going to call Kevin Durant on day one. Sure. Even though he basically has a red shirt year next year, mm-hmm. 80% of Kevin Durant. And this is what uh, Tim McMahon said is worth a lot more than a max contract. Um, so, you ha- absolutely have to at least put that option on the table. And then the thing that got me about the radio address, he said, I hate to say it, but I think maybe this does give the Mavericks a chance at him because their medical staff is so highly regarded. Mm-hmm. Casey Smith is an absolute wizard. Um, so hearing the words, give the Mavs a chance at Kevin Durant, you know, set off a lot of bells in my head. Yeah. So like, I think the chances of, you know, the ultimate goal coming around from that, meaning Kevin Durant signs with the Mavericks or mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard's, I think that's still very small, but I mean, there's reason for, to keep those kind of on the back burner on the radar. Sure. Uh, you yeah. have to at least place those calls and at least be ready for if something wonderful happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And as you said earlier, next year, it's just about Luca and KP playing together finally, seeing how that looks. We're not expecting to be championship contenders next year. We would like, obviously, to return to the playoffs. And I think that they're. You know, we got to see what they put together of a roster, but just having Luca and KP together, I mean, KP, everything that we've heard about him in practice is he just has looked phenomenal, like hasn't missed a beat is uh, what we've heard. So you add that with Luca, who you presume some kind of at least small step forward from what was already a historically good, probably the best rookie year from a teenager we've ever seen in NBA history. I mean, it, that alone might be able to get you into the playoffs, let alone what they're able to add to it. So if that's the case, if you can get a Kevin Durant with the red shirt year, as you mentioned, then yeah, that's that's great. You have him sitting over there, resting up with our renowned uh, team of trainers and everything. And then if, if he comes back 80% of what he was, that's easily still good enough to be like your second or 2A, so to speak with this team and even if he doesn't have the explosion that he used to have even if he's not able to i mean he's 6'10 so it's not like he has to be much of a high flyer but kevin durant sitting out there sniping from the three-point line is deadly enough in its own right and luca generates great looks for guys all over the court because of his phenomenal passing ability and vision uh so there's there's going to be no shortage of effectiveness you could still get out of durant while saying Hey, even if you wanted to not have to put as much of a physical strain on your body, he got weird a little bit at the end of his run with OKC. If you remember him coming off that foot injury, that was actually kind of speculated to be one of the reasons why he left to go to the more sure thing. Uh, Warriors in that case was he wouldn't have to carry as much of the load in that regard, and it wouldn't take the physical toll on him. Similar thinking here, just coming off an Achilles, uh, certainly probably a worse injury, although the Jones fractures not the easiest thing to come back from either. So you got Porzingis, who he named the unicorn. Uh, not that that was any weird foreshadowing. It's just a coincidence. And Luka Doncic, who probably is one of the best young point forwards and probably already a top 20, 25 player in the league. Like probably around that area. Uh, that's that's a lethal, lethal combination and you got time to let them wait and let them get rested up. So if yeah. it's there, you got to take it. But I, I have no doubt Dallas will check under every stone and check every potential big possibility, even if it seems almost too good to be true. 
Yeah, I and like I said, you have to like and like Mark Cuban has said, you have to run out those ground balls. And especially um it's it's not like the Achilles injury is a good thing. It's like a right, it's a terrible thing. But I mean, at the same time, that does maybe give Dallas a little bit more of an opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if you're if you pay Kevin Durant a four year max deal, I mean, yeah, you take three healthy years of Durant yep. if, if he agrees to that. So um one other name that's kind of been in the news lately, and I mentioned it in my article too, is Al Horford. Yep, I was yeah. com- coming around on that one. Go on. It is so weird what's been going on. And like I said, I, I, I try to listen to as much Mark Stein as I can on whatever podcast he's on. Mm-hmm. And he said today on the on the, on the the Ben Simmons, uh, wait, Bill Simmons, what am I doing? Ben Simmons podcast. It's He said today on the Bill Simmons, I think I said that earlier too, Bill all, Simmons all podcast. All 76ers news. Yeah, all, all breaking three-pointers. But like he... <laughs> He said that like that he is a source of great intrigue. Actually, I think that was Woj said he's a source of great intrigue, but like he's a mystery man. Like mm-hmm. someone told him on draft night, Al Horford, four years, one hundred and twelve million. Yep, it's it's happening. He's like, well, who? And he's like, I don't know. And he said he's asked the Mavericks five times. <laughs> are, is this you? Are, are are you guys the one offering? And like, it's so weird because like everyone thinks it's the Mavericks. Right. And the Mavericks are like, oh, we didn't even know he's going to be available. And then Tim McMahon said that they were playing dumb. He got he got Harrison Barnes when he asked him, meaning like, oh, no, it's fine. Like, yeah. By that reference, he meant like, oh, we're not going to trade you. And then boom, they traded him. Yep. So like, my thought is like, why would they say yes? And then like Brad Townsend said today that like in his article, if Dallas – were to pay a big man max money, it would be Al Horford. So that kind of sets the parameters of the situation. Like if if Dallas has a max slot, which they do, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean Horford is automatically in the picture. Like right. so it's only if they wanted to pay Max to a big, which it, it is not I mean, in 2019, are you really willing to put max money on a center? Agreed. So so that kind of like what that told me is that like Dallas values potentially the fit, but paying thirty or one hundred and twelve million to a to a thirty three year old center, even if even one as great as Al Horford, probably is not Plan A. Right. Um, I think Dallas would be much improved next year. Al, Al Horford, I, I'm very high on. Mm-hmm. But so th- there's all sorts of mixed information. Like I said, if Mark Stein's having to ask a team five times, <laughs> yeah, guys planning on making a move here. Yeah, it's kind of a weird situation. I don't think I've ever seen anything like what Al Horford's dealing with right now or what what his situation is like. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is a point of intrigue for sure. I mean, there there's, at 33 years old, even though he has still been quite effective in recent years, I just don't feel like he fits the window for Dallas. And, and, and the number you point out, out $25 million a year roughly, that doesn't sound like the kind of money you want to pay, not alone just to a center, but also one that's going to be 34, 35, and then you're paying them that at 36. Like, that just doesn't seem like uh, a very good investment at that point. But if you were to look at that, his fit alongside Porzingis in the immediate, I do think, would be solid. Porzingis is more comfortable as a four. He's not a great rebounder despite being seven foot three. I think his best year of his career was like 7.3 six rebounds or something like that something to that effect so Mm -hmm. there's value there and he's a good pick and pop player which would work well obviously with luca but i just think the age muddies the water too much in that regard what what is your your thoughts on now the the craziest theory that seems to be floating around out there uh, short of getting a Kawhi or a durant or something like that that Dallas could try and figure out a way or maybe make it happen so that they add Kemba and Horford. I, I've seen some references to that, and I will say one thing on Horford as far as the timeline goes. The timeline is to get to the playoffs as soon as possible, and Tim mm-hmm. McMahon said that Mavericks view that as like they need to get KP and, and Luka playoff seasoning yes. qu- as quick as possible. So, I mean, so there's there there's a, there's a way to look at the Al Horford potential contract as like, well, this fits. But then, of course, when you think of paying him $30 million at age 37, you're like, well, that doesn't fit. Yeah, I, th- I think it fits in the theory of we need to get these guys to the playoffs as soon as possible. So I think it's a fit there. Um, I haven't read into too much of the – I think we actually talked about this earlier, the potential uh, – the, the thought of getting Kimba and Al Horford. Mm-hmm. I, I've seen some people talking about it. I think it's a sign-and-trade possibility that we were yeah. mentioning earlier. Yep. And, and the proposal that I saw – 
yeah, I have my doubts. I guess theoretically it's possible, but the, from what I've seen, I think is like if you if you get the sign and trade done with Kemba, and then you, I think part of the trade would be to give Charlotte Justin Jackson, um, Courtney Lee, who is then expiring, which gives them capital. It's a very mm-hmm. Mavs friendly <laughs> proposal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you could be like, well, Charlotte doesn't come out, you know, completely screwed. Well, yeah, that's not really how trades work. Right. So I mean. And everyone knows that. And I think it's a good idea in theory, and I get why people would be excited about it. And heck, if it happens, I, I, I'd be cheering with the rest of them. But I, I, mm-hmm. I don't think that's the most realistic situation. But yes, there is technically a way to get there. Yeah. I mean, if, if you could pull that off, I know I said I wasn't super high on adding Horford, but if you can get him somehow in this miraculous deal in which you also get Kemba, well then, yeah, that changes the discussion because now... If you have Kimba Walker, Horford, Luka, and KP, suddenly you're not even looking at it as, oh, we think we're a playoff team. Now you're looking at it and you're like, add in the Warriors and their injuries, losing two of their stars, really three, because Cousins isn't going to be coming back to uh, to the Warriors. So, yeah, the, the West feels much more wide open now, and obviously Houston's going to try and figure out what they got to do. They're pretty much making it known that Anybody not named James Harden's available, although they've tried to walk back Chris Paul after hearing nobody yeah. wants him in that absurd contract they gave him. So as long as they're still playing the State Farm commercials, I just believe everything's fine. You know, <laughs> that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you remember the end of Chris Paul's time in uh in the Clippers franchise, I think that was around the time you had you know DeAndre Jordan was in the commercials with them as well, and okay, uh, a curse. they it's they a did State not Farm curse. Yeah, they did not get along very well. We we heard how Chris Paul would kind of demean DeAndre and Jordan and everything like that. And I think at the, like the last DeAndre commercial he was in with Chris Paul before he came to Houston was the one where he's like dressed in drag, DeAndre Jordan. So oh, may, maybe that. Chris Paul was uh, using some creative influence there. Like, no, 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 this will be a let's do something with this. This is a good bit. I don't like this guy anyway. But yeah, um, yeah. If you if you get Kemba and Horford the conversation changes and I'm no longer worried about Horford's age. Now suddenly it's like, okay, okay, here we go. Like now you're not even looking at it in terms of a two to three year window. Now you're looking at it as in like, Oh, okay. The window's officially open then. All right. Like why not? It, you might as well go all out for it the next couple of years if you got that and it works out, but it's, it's a very long shot. It feels like a pipe dream, but you know, Insane things do happen sometimes in NBA free agency, obviously, whether it was the the Miami Heat big three or Kevin Durant going to uh, a 73-win Warriors team that should have been back-to-back champions at that point and then having the audacity to say he was just trying to put them over the hump. Yeah, and yeah, it's just, I guess I think we should call that the State Farm curse because apparently that's a real thing. One thing I'll mention too about that deal, we were just talking about the sign and trade Mm -hmm. uh, to get potentially Kimba and Al Horford. Um, If I'm not mistaken, I think that would involve a stretch wave of Tim Hardaway Jr. Which, yeah, I think I did see that. That really bothers me. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, because poor Tim Hardaway Jr. I mean, well, actually, he probably doesn't even care. He's making a lot of money. I mean, he's, he's due 20 million this year, which is insane. And then his player option for the next season is 18.9, mm-hmm. basically 19 million. Um, so again, I think that potential deal that would make that a possibility is, is a little more mass friendly than uh, like, for example, I, I don't, like I said, I, I think, I don't think Charlotte takes that deal if it's put on the table today. Agreed. Um, stretch waving is, I mean, what Detroit, the Detroit Pistons are still paying Josh Smith. <laughs> that's where oh, stretch waving. That's where stretch waving kind of gets wow. Under my skin a little bit. Like, do you really want to be on the hook for Tim Hardaway Jr. until twenty twenty four? No, not really. Just, I don't even know how much because he has, he has a player option, like I said, for two seasons from now, and I, I don't know exactly how that works. If like, because if you just take next year, mm-hmm. twenty million, but I, with his player option, it's it's basically forty million. So you're looking at stretching 40 million at over five years. That's an eight mil hit every year. And I'm not sure if I have the math right on that, but I mean, that's, that's a pretty sizable amount. I mean, yeah. do you really, I mean, I, I, Dallas figures to be an over the cap team here mm-hmm. going forward for a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm figuring they're going to be a pretty good playoff team, mm-hmm. but still, I mean, that's just, I, I, I just don't, I had my doubts. Yeah. <laughs> 
super negative. I don't like to be super negative on that stuff, but I mean, that just seems not ideal and right. also not very uh, practical in terms of how Charlotte would view it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, part of the problem I mentioned earlier is it sounds like Charlotte's not even interested in doing anything in terms of going over the cap. They're trying to avoid it at all costs. So sending them back a Courtney Lee or some big contract like that, I don't even know how much that appeals to them really. So it's it probably doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it probably doesn't. So but yeah. I mean it's a good idea. I mean it's 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 a big thought exercise now at mm -hmm. this point in the off season. I mean there's there's a lot of ways um or theoretically Dallas could get I mean not a lot of ways, but that that is a way that Dallas could get to the to have the ability to get both Kimba and Al Horford. And if they get that, I mean, in an ideal world, if that happens, Dallas is shooting for home court advantage next year in the playoffs. Like that's, yeah. that's a good solid team. Yeah, I, I, mean, I agree. We all want that sooner rather than later. So I don't blame that idea for coming about. Right. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they're able to do with that. Um, yeah. If they, if they were to go with the probably more likely approach where it's adding multiple players, um without dragging out too much longer i'm curious if they have to go with the more role player oriented approach we we've mentioned pat beverly obviously uh who would be another player or two that you would have significant interest in in that regard terrence ross for sure just because and again there, i have some hesitancy with that i know like i said i like to read tim cato and i know mm -hmm. he's high on him as well too uh, being in a contract year uh, this year was probably, I mean, I'm not saying I doubt his motivation at any other point, but like he was in a contract year this year and he yeah. played really well. So, I mean, you have to consider that maybe that was kind of a, an overarching factor. I think he would be great here. He's a really good scorer. He shoots really well from three. I mm -hmm. like that. Pat Beverly, like I said, I, I, I really like the idea of him here. I think it's very likely. Um, another name, like I said, Bohan Bogdanovich. I, yeah. I don't, the, the, the the Pacers really like him from what yeah. I've, what I've read. Um, I, Zach Lowe said that they have, he mentioned that the Pacers and the Bucks, and this is also relevant to another name, both have walk away numbers for Malcolm Brogdon and Bohog Bogdanovich. Like where really? if other teams offer up to this point, then they'll, but of course Bogdanovich is an unrestricted free agent and Brogdon's a restricted. Yeah. But so I, I know their incumbent teams both really like those players. Yeah. Now, Bogdanovich can leave whenever he wants. He's not, you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it's an easier path for the Mavs to get him, but I know Brogdon is a super tricky path because, I mean, yeah. Uh, Woj mentioned on the show right before we started recording this that he wouldn't be surprised if, if Brogdon gets a $20 million a year offer sheet, which, I mean, if we're talking about paying Pat Beverly $12 yeah. million a year, I, I can stomach a $20 million a year contract for Malcolm Brogdon. I think he's yeah. great. His fit alongside Luka would be great. So I, I like I like Brogdon. I like Bogdanovich. I'm not saying those two are likely. Mm -hmm. uh, Terrence Ross. I love Patrick Beverly. Um, Patrick Beverly just gives me that he's 30. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. I, I think um, Brogdon. Uh, yeah, 20 million. That it feels high, but yeah, when you put it in the context of Beverly, that that walks it back for sure. If you're if you're going to 12 or even 14 or something like that for Beverly, then yeah, that has to play out then and. I think Brogdon would be a fantastic add, exactly the kind of thing they need to add, uh, short of adding like a, a superstar. So if you could add a couple of those guys, like if you split the thirty million, and in that you added a Beverly and a Brogdon, like it, let's say you were able to do that. Now that's obviously super ambitious because that's asking both guys to take just under a little bit under the numbers that we outlined or speculated. But if you add a couple guys like that, I think that's combine kind of the value of one of those secondary upper tier guys uh in that case so i i'd feel better about going that route than i would d'angelo russell <laughs> yeah i russell excites me to a to an extent i don't think that's likely i know Q, yeah. or stein was asked stein was actually on 105.3 the fan recently and they mm -hmm. asked him about d'angelo russell to the mavs and he said he hadn't heard anything about that he said that would run counter to what they're trying to do yeah which was interesting to me um one other name that I didn't mention, and I, I, I don't see this happening, and I haven't really read any intel. I know Brad Townsend is high on this, but Tobias Harris. Yep. Um, his max would be a four-year, $140 million deal. Um, he's also young, mm -hmm. um, so it still should is not been, an ideal yeah, number. Should have been an all-star, arguably, in the should, West. 
should have been an all-star. Um, of course, in the last year of that hypothetical deal, you're paying him $37.6 million. Um, I, I remember I asked, and one guy I recommend following on Twitter for this kind of information is Jeff Siegel. Uh, he has a lot of good information as far as, like, just all the cap sheet knowledge I ever need. I think nice. the the max offer that Dallas could offer Brogdon, uh, it would be four years, $117 million. Okay. Um, now that's, I don't want to ever see that number again, <laughs> but I mean, that's obviously way high, but I mean, yeah. if Dallas threw that amount, I highly doubt Milwaukee matches that. But then again, Dallas would be paying 25 million a year. There's for- also the risk there too. Then, uh, although it's not a week long period, like it used to be, you know, we got burned by that in the Deandre Jordan 2015 thing. It is still what, two or three days now that it, that the restricted think- team has to match it. Yeah, I think the moratorium is two or three days. I don't know exactly off the top of my head. Yeah, because, oh, oh man, that's so crazy. It used to be a week. That just so easily could wreck your entire off season because that money's tied up until the team decides. Yeah, I, that just didn't make any sense. No. Um, I, I like Tobias Harris's fit here in theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just don't know if that's an ideal use of that much money. Uh, but then again, I mean, people can make the same argument for Kimba. I don't know yeah. if I'm higher on Kimba or Tobias Harris at the max. Probably I would say Kimba just because I think he's a higher level player. Yeah. But yeah, the the max, if, if, if anyone's wondering, just a random thought, if you're wondering what is the max the Mavericks could offer Malcolm Brogdon, it's four years, 117 million. Yeah. And that probably won't get thrown out there. Dallas wouldn't even need to go that high. I don't mm-hmm. think now it hasn't been, obviously it, w- it won't be reported what Milwaukee's, walk away number is for Brogdon sure clearly that would be higher than it I would Um, assume so I would I mean if I'm guessing and this means absolutely nothing this is just a pure guess I would 29.25 million I I would say like if if you threw and I'm not saying this would be wise either if you threw a four-year hundred million dollar deal at Malcolm Brogdon and obviously you can structure that to where like they when they did that Parsons deal they Mm -hmm. made that I think Daryl Morey called that the most untradeable contract he'd ever seen. Yep. Clearly they could dress that up like that. But if you do a four year, hundred million dollar deal at Malcolm Brogdon, I strongly doubt Milwaukee matches that. Uh, and yeah. they're like, okay, all right, go, go get your hundred million and have fun with that. So yeah, 25 million a year. That, that is a high price to pay uh, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to know what their walk away number is. Cause yeah, that, that definitely feels North of what it probably is, but I wonder how much North, that's almost like a poker situation where you're trying to guess you don't want to overpay yourself, but you're still trying to see if there's like a sweet spot where you can make that work financially for you. Yeah. And it's like you were saying too, it's not so much the money with a restricted free agent. I mean, it is, but also the time, like the risk that you run of missing out on other people. Like, and so if you were towing that walk away line that clearly Milwaukee's not going to like tell you, like you run the risk of like having those three days go by for nothing. And that's kind of the scary thing with restricted free agents is that, you know, say Milwaukee decides to match, then you've missed out on the, those three days when other free agents that you could have been targeting and could have had mutual interest with come off the board. So that that's the danger in that RFA market. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's going to be an interesting uh, free agency period for sure. Like I said, we'll be live streaming when all that starts at five Oh one. So hopefully we'll get a lot of, uh, good breaking news, whether it's guys signing or even just the speculation itself for that couple hours there that we're running live. Uh, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to to kind of come on the show, call in and all that. Um, we can. I will actually be on my anniversary dinner oh. date with my wife on that night. So. All right, never mind then. Congratulations. Thank you. I might mischievously be checking my phone, but I'll yeah. probably be limited in my in my interaction with Twitter or any kind of news, I'll probably just check it all in the morning, but okay. Fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Yeah. It'll be, a, it'll be a, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, it, it really is. June 30th. Cannot get here quick enough. Definitely. Uh, well, you want to tell everyone where they can find more of your stuff? Yeah. I, obviously I, I wrote for you guys on the Dallas prospect, which was great. If you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Zach M F F L. That's Zach with a K Z A C K M F F L. And like I mentioned, the guy who um, I, I look for for my um, for my uh, cap information is Jeff Siegel. That's at J G S I E G E L, and he's really really good. He writes. He, he's like a machine. Anytime something happens, like the update is up there within ten minutes without fail. So he, he's really nice. Great. Cool. 
Well, Zach, thanks for joining me. Uh, definitely have to have you on again sometime to talk more Mavericks and, uh, you know, whatever your interest in is cowboy season and talking football. I know we've had offline conversations about that as well. Yeah, and it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate it.